Okay. Okay. All right. This is the office building, and the whole office was in this one place. It was inside a high fence, which mm -hmm. was much higher than the one here, and it went th on this side of the office. Mm -hmm. The main gate of the mill was right here. And uh, that was the only way to get in from this side, but the delivery and cotton and the, so on were on the other side. Now, the uh, people would come in and park in this area and go into the office. Now, during, in 1934, the flying squadron lined up out here and outside the main gate, and they were a very loud crew. I remember hearing them. The, when the governor called out the National Guard after the plant mill was dynamited, the machine gun company, I believe it was from Wilson, came and there was a machine gun was set right here in front of the office, right in front of the main gate. And they had tear gas and the troopers and live ammunition. And uh, one of the uh, flying squadron folks said, I'm not afraid of that thing. I faced a lot of them in the Argonne. And the trooper says, well, then you know what they can do, don't you? <laughs> and he shut up. But there was never a shot fired. I got a whiff of tear gas over here on the steps, and uh, the mill was closed down for a And my father had a 45 on his hip, and had a 30-30 in the back of his car, all loaded with soft-nosed bullets. And if anybody had tried to do anything with him, that would have been all too great. Okay, now let's hold that. We'll tell that again as they move over here. Right. Okay. This is the office of the mill where we would come in through the main gate right here. Uh, there were about seven or eight personnel in here for, at any one time, including my father and his brother. The entry would come right through here and parking was here. They, in 1934, the flying squadrons came and picketed here. The whole mill, including the office, was surrounded by a high chain link She's fence. She's getting a buzz, because I'm sorry. I'll see this. I'll we'll work around that. I'll work around mm -hmm. that. Okay, gentlemen, when you're ready. Okay, okay. sir. Yeah, this is the office of the mill, and I'm the main it again. I'm sorry. office of the mill. Start again, please. No, it's uh, a this is the mill office right here. The main gate was right along where the sidewalk is, and the whole mill was surrounded by a tall chain link fence with barbed wire on top, uh, considerably taller than this fence is right here. Now, in 1934, the flying squadrons came and picketed the I'm main sorry, gate here. Sorry, but say in 1934. What? You said 1934. I, I, I said 19. Yeah. In 1934. The flying squadrons came and picketed in this area right here and uh, raised a lot of noise and prevented the workers from coming to work. Uh, my father would come to work, but he would carry a 45 on his hip and a 30-30 all loaded with soft-nosed bullets in the back of his car. He got through the picket lines. Now, the, when the plant mill was bombed in Burlington, the government called out the National Guard. A machine gun company, uh, I believe from Wilson, North Carolina, came here. And the machine gun was placed right here in front of the office steps. There were tear gas canisters there too. I remember getting a whiff of that as I came uh, outside to see what it was like. I wanted to see what it smelled like and got too close. Uh, this was live ammunition, steel jackets. One of the flying squadrons hollered out, I'm not afraid of that thing. I faced a lot of them over in the Argonne Forest. And the troopers very calmly says, well, then you know exactly what they can do, don't you? Uh, with this, the man turned his back and didn't say another word. Uh, the picketing lasted for approximately three weeks. Uh, during the nighttime, mill workers as volunteers were armed with shotguns and buckshot and high-powered rifles and were stationed around in the back and the, the corners at the places where the machine gun, where the machine gunners and the National Guard couldn't go. Uh, they were to protect uh, against bombing from the road in the back. And I remember getting up with my father many times at night, coming out and making rounds to check on the, uh, the guards to be sure they were all right and be sure they had something to eat or, or that they were getting along okay. But it was a right fearsome time. Uh, the whole thing lasted about three weeks. Um, 
at one meeting, which uh, the flying squad was called, the uh, they extolled the advantages of unionism and told the workers that they were being exploited and not being paid enough and had all terrible working conditions, etc., which is a union uh, spiel at that time. And when they got through, one of the, uh, they said, are there any questions? One of the workers got up and says, are you through speaking? He said, yes. He said, well, I'd like to say something, that when back in the early part of the Depression, there were three mills in this town, two of them closed down. This mill ran two shifts a week. Wasn't much, but it paid us enough to buy firewood and cornmeal and fat back to feed our families. The mill didn't make any money. We made the cloth and stored it. And they took care of us when we needed it, and now we'll take care of them. Why don't you take your trucks and go back up to Yankee Yan where you came from and leave us alone and let us get back to work. And uh, that was the end of that. Were there any uh, employees of this mill who were on strike? I don't think there were. I don't know of any. It's possible that it could have been, but I don't, uh, I don't think so. I think this, they felt that it was imposition on them that they were, people had come down and interfering with their way of life and their way of work. You say came down, where did they come from? Uh, from the accents, they came mainly from uh, Joyce, uh, Ohio, or uh, someplace up north. So you actually heard them speaking? Yes. And uh, it was a rather frightening time in this area, particularly since the dynamite incidents and that sort of thing. How old were you then? I was 12 years old. Must have been very vivid for you as very, a young man. Though. Very vivid, very yeah. vivid. I can see it today. Yeah. And uh, I can see my father, I'm sure his blood pressure went up quite a bit. And uh, I've always said that that contributed to his death. What happened after that? Uh, after the flying squadrons left, the mill went back to work and continued on like they had before. Was there any attempt to organize here either before or after that? Uh, I don't know of any concerted attempt. I'm sure that the union organizers had, had come by and they periodically would make attempts to do so. And uh, as far as I know, the company was never unionized as, as a Travora. And even after Cannon bought it, I do not believe they were ever unionized. I don't think Cannon, Cannon is unionized today. Mm -hmm. no, I don't believe it is. You've mentioned going around with your father uh, to visit the, the, the mills. Oh, yes. And, uh, well, I'd usually hide and get out go in the office, much to the dismay of the office crew, because I was rather an office wrecker, playing with the machines and everything. But my dad would take me on making his mill rounds. He usually went once or twice a day throughout the mill, visited every department. He knew the workers by name and knew about their families, would ask about their, uh, how their new child was doing or whether their wife was, was getting over their illness. Uh, we'd stop and I'd play with the bobbins and uh, he'd go by and show me how things worked and we'd watch the weavers and the carters and once we f and went by the machine shop where we'd get a lathe and dad would turn out a, a wooden gun for me to play with and the uh, Ruth Hunter, the machinist, was always uh, glad to see us come around. Then we'd stop uh, on, that, on the way over to the finishing plant where at the store, at Holt store, and I'd get an, an Eskimo pie, and we'd continue on our trip to the finishing plant where they did the dyeing, finishing, and gluing. They were making gauntlets then for the gloves, and uh, on up through the finishing and then we'd come back to the office where I'd stay till it was time for Dad to go home. And uh, it was a good experience. I enjoyed it. And if I hadn't gone into medicine, I might have enjoyed going into the textile mm -hmm. business. But my dad uh, uh, sort of uh, wanted to be a doctor all of his life, and textiles was his second choice. So medicine was my first choice. Thank you. All right. They knew the people, so that we get some idea of <coughs> that. You know, he just didn't come in. Oh no! I, very think, right. I think that we need that okay. for right. a slight. Okay, you should play that two camera, right? Yeah, and then okay. then he'll show us where All the machine. Right. All right, sir. Okay, when you're All ready, right. sir. Uh, this is the office building. It was built in the late 1920s. 
And my father's office was at this window right here. My uncle Harvey's was the room behind that. They built the mill in 1901, and he stayed with it until he died in 1936. Uh, Uncle Harvey was more of the business part of it. My father liked to go into the mill and visit the people, and he knew them by name, knew their families, and would joke and talk with them as we visited around. He made rounds at least once a day, and if there were two shifts, he tried to make it twice a day. And uh, with this, uh, he got to know people pretty well, and the people thought an awful lot of him. Uh, you used to see the church at his funeral. It was overflowing. The machine gun during the strike of 1934 was placed right in front of these steps. The tear gas canisters were on the side, and I got too close to one. And the high fence of chain link with barbed wire on the top ran along about where this telephone pole is in the edge oh, of the machine. street. The main building, uh, main entrance of the to the building, uh, to the mill, was right here with a swinging gate. And uh, this was where the flying squadrons uh, did their picketing. Mm -hmm. Now, what did your father think of all that? My father was very upset about it. In fact, he was, he had a, a pretty good temper and would uh, express himself in no uncertain terms. Uh, I think this kind of got him out of uh, the Roosevelt camp. And since this apparently was uh, encouraged, or at least uh, uh, endorsed by the administration, but uh, he has never got forgotten or forgiven Roosevelt for this. But uh, he was he was very upset about the whole thing. Good. Do you remember that? No. <laughs> Machine gun was right here. Who are y'all with? We are doing it for PBS. PBS. Yes. <laughs> now, my dad used to own the mill, uh -huh. and uh, so we were talking about this in 1934 when they had that big strike. Oh, okay. How long have you lived around here? Uh, well, all my life, 38 years, but... Do you remember anything about this? No. Your parents never told you anything about this? No, they didn't, no, no. Did, did they work in the mill? No. What's, what is your name? Sam Braxton. Braxton. Okay. Are you any kin to uh, Theo and... And Drusilla and EA and Darnell? EA, yeah. Hi, what kid? Well, my husband's side. Yeah, what? Uh, what? Uh, his cousin. Okay. And uh, they, were, they were in school with me when I was oh, in school really? with him. And uh, there's, a bo there's a bunch of them. In fact, Theo lives in Charlotte now, I think. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a bunch of Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, y'all might want to talk to our plant manager. I don't know. He would know all this stuff. Would you like to do that? Sure. He's not here right now. Okay. Y'all want, want to wait a while? We're going to go get some lunch and then we'll maybe come back. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Okay. Let's right. go eat. Okay. So is that the town is like that where everybody knows everybody. <laughs> everybody. <coming>. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you, nobody business. You, if uh, somebody got kissed good night. On Sunday night, Monday, everybody in school knew it.
is Mr. Stoney. This is uh, Francis Allen and Francis Bill Allen. Allen. And this is Bill, my husband. Hello. Hey, Please tell you, Miss Allen. Hello. 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 Glad to see you. I haven't seen you since our last. Uh, you going we're going to, we're going to stay right out here. If you sit better than you can. No, we're, we're here. here. We're here. So, uh, who no, are they? The living room. It's the, these are the folks. This is another Mr. Stoney. Uh, he is Judy. Hello. And this is this Judy. Is Judy. And they run, they run the, the cameras and things, and they want to talk with you a little bit about the, about the mill back in the 30s. And y'all don't want to go in the leading room? No, we're here. We're fine right here. Well, let me right get here. some chairs in. Okay. Let me wipe that one out. Okay. Can I help you, Francis? No. No, you can't help with do nothing. I know. I know. <laughs> she's, a, she's a hope. She's stubborn. It comes normal. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> you, worked in, you worked in the mill with this gentleman? No. You did? No. I thought you did. Not with you. I worked no, with no, you. No, no, with the dad. With yeah. The dad. Yeah. Well, Will. I don't have time yeah. to sit on this front porch. His daddy, his daddy and his his daddy's brother, who man Harvey White, were two of the best men. And they had Seymour Holt up there with their boss man. They over the whole thing. He was good. Hill. He was plenty good. I go get one. Yeah, of he them was holes. Seymour was the superintendent. What what did uh, you uh, what did you do in the mill? Will I went to a hole in rope, I mean, spool, then put them up on the spool from the women that put it on, I don't know what they did. They put it on, what they do? They, they took it off of the, the uh, little thing that come off the spinning frame. Put them on the bobbin. Put it on the bobbin, and they took it off of the bobbin, had a damn thing here, and they put it on a spool running around yeah. this way, and they put that in the warp mill. That made the warps. And they took the warp to the warp mill and they put it on this thing here and it went down in a sack. A big old paper sack. Uh, not paper but a tow bag yeah. or something. And they would haul that. I don't know where they carry it from there, but they carry it to the die house. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. They died. They Y'all won't sit down? They died at them things. And they come out on a great old long thing like that. And that Y'all don't leave me out here. I'm going in y'all. I don't know. Can I get y'all in the thing? I was, I was, I was six years old when I went in Benco, and at that time, when you got eight or ten years old, you were ready to go to work. You could work. But I went in there with Daddy. My Daddy was a carpenter and a miller all of his life, but we got to Benco. I don't know how, how come we got there, but he was down there cutting the, the stuff off the roll of these bobbins. Mm -hmm. That stayed on it, didn't come off. It was free. He'd down there cutting that off, and I'd go down and help him cut that off. But while I was down there, I had one woman with a, with a, I thought was a friend of mine, she let me run the looms. That, she had five or four, five, four, or maybe a six looms, just two of them together, and one right in front of her. But you, you put, uh, had two or three bobbins over here. And that, that loom knows when to switch that bobbin and take another color. And that's what made checking the cloth like that. You have a different thing there. How old were you when you first started uh, working in the mill? I was about seven or eight years seven, old. Seven, eight then. years old. What when I wasn't it? working, I was helping my yeah, daddy yeah. then, but uh, I could go down there and help him. You could go help your folks if you had to. And I had to. About what year was that? Hmm. When were you born? I would say it around 1914. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Long time ago. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that was my first work in the mill, the first time I remember. My daddy used to run a uh, engine at Carolina Mill. A great old long engine. It had a belt as long as it that road bank out there. And a great big old wheel up there. Y'all didn't have that up there. Y'all got, got, that got electrical stuff up there. But uh, he run that, and his daughter married, and he turned all to run the, the, the engine in the mill to run that. They had, they had the, the weaving room, the weaving room and the spinning room, I believe, in Carolina run off of water. But they got other motors to put upstairs, and uh, that was when I went to work over there. They had motors up there, but they still run that engine. But anyhow, it was something else. That was, it's just something. See, that a weaving room, to me it was. I never did weave. 
but that thing go back over here, and the right bobbin would be in the right place. That thing behind it would hit it thicker, bit long stick. You remember them up the other mill. That thing would hit that thing and knock it through yonder and come back, and it, the color of that what made the the uh, the color the color yeah. of the, yeah. the yarn the food, yeah. uh, cloth they was making. Yeah. I, I miss a whole lot of words because I'm 84 and had two strokes and one passion stroke that made three and then I got better doctors and I, 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 I just all the pieces for doctors. <laughs> well, well this about. doctor right here has, he, been, has been telling us about when he was uh, 11, 12 years old. Yeah. He was remembering a big strike up there. Do you remember that strike in 34? Yeah. Tell us about it. We didn't have no strike at Hall River out of Trollywood. But you remember Big Joe Phillips? You don't remember him? Yeah. He was a superintendent or something that come here. He was going to do wonders during that. He was here during that strike. Yeah, I don't remember. Seymour Holt was a, was a superintendent. Well, he was, Seymour Holt was still there, but yeah. this old man come down here, well done. He learned what he learned in Greensboro for Cone mm -hmm. Mill. He was a hell. Was he down at Trollywood? He, he come down here and stayed here a little while, but uh, he was here during that strike. Well, it, it was dangerous. We had one fella, uh, I don't know where he lived, but he worked at Needmore. Now, one of the mills in Burlington, but anyway, he went up there and they were throwing some kind of bombs over the fence. And he got, I don't know how he got hurt, but he lost one arm on the camera. It was getting bad, so, we just didn't go to work that morning. And Big Joe, he come down and uh, told us that, uh, you remember Willie Phillips? Oh, vaguely, vaguely. He was a spin room boss up here and he finally got over to be all of it. He was his brother, but he wasn't like Willie Phillips, uh-uh. But he come down there and he come out there at the store and told them all out there, I wasn't even out there. And they told them all, if they didn't go to that mill to work, at dinner time, the ones that lived in cutting the houses would get out of them at the end of the week. And I don't know who done it, but somebody called Seymour up there, called up there and talked to Seymour about it. And uh, so Seymour was down in 15 minutes from the mill. He told him, <laughs> said, we ain't got these guards out there at the doors with men with guns to guard y'all. So that ain't what we got them for. I said, if y'all don't feel like you're safe, don't go in there. And said, if you get hungry, come on up to the office. I said, we'll give you something, something, something to get some, something to eat with. I said, you know, you don't go in there if you don't feel safe. You know, that made everybody feel a whole lot better. But Big Joe never did come back no more. He was gone. He never had to come back. Oh, a lot of things he had in mind he was going to do. But this wouldn't work at Charlottewood. He, uh, one of the things was we have to, I was running, uh, well, I, come out of, I went there to run, uh, uh, not to run nothing, but to work a day or two till uh, Chuck Gaines come back to work. He's hauling rope. And that's what I'd done. Old man Bob Bain, he was the boss man. So I worked three or four days, and he come in there and said, Bill, said, uh, how about it? said, uh, I ain't gonna fool with Chuck no more. I said, I don't even know where he's at. So I ain't gonna fool with him no more. And his mom and daddy were both working there, but uh, so I said, well, I ain't got a job. I, I was looking for one, but I ain't got one yet. I can do this. He said, yeah, I know you can. And at that time, it was different from what it was I first, what, I mean, when I got into later on working in the mill, if you got your job caught up and I was over here sitting over to sleep or in the buff box to sleep, I mean, Harvey White or Will White come by, I said, he got a good hand. He'd keep his job up and sleep at half the time. But when Big <laughs> Joe come here, he tried to do something about that. And it, it, it was right. But that's the way they call us. If we were settled, settled over our sleep and our job was up, that was all they expected. Well, now, uh, who, who caused that strike? I don't remember. <laughs> it just kind of went over the country. <coughs> and it was cotton mills. You want a chair to sit in? She said no, one time. I need a chair. I didn't have it the next Christmas. I done broke it, <laughs> tore it up. And my mama says, "How much?" She said, "You broke an iron horse." 
And I remember my first Christmas, I remember, when the, I didn't have no no brothers, all sisters. And they brought, uh, Santa Claus brought two of my sisters, the younger sisters, uh, uh, who was, I don't know what kind of doll we call it, what they, kind of like what they call Barbie dolls now, but it was had a, a stuffed body. The whole body was stuffed with uh, sawdust or something. And you bought, at that time, you'd just buy the head. You could buy the head, but I don't have much. Pretty, black, blades, high, oh, it was beautiful. My mama had to buy me one before I was happy at all. She got me one. And I, I was fooled when I was about 13 or 14 years old. And believe it or not, I had done served some time in Carolina Mill, uh, working his, on slubbers. But uh, he got sick. And uh, I had to quit school. I, was, I went about a month in the seventh grade. And uh, I had to quit school. He run a grist mill down at Snow Camp, Dixon's Mill. And uh, I had to quit to run that mill at 13, 14 years old. And I tell them, I told them I, it was the proudest thing I'd ever had happen to me that I could quit school and run that grist mill and, and plow, make flour and cornmeal. And and uh, we had a, a thing down there, we could just take corn. First and I was saying, they take corn and throw it in the cob and all, and it'd push it up and throw it over in this other thing and make cow feed out of it. I had never seen one, but I, I could run it. And I told them, I said, I was as goddamn proud of myself as I've ever been when I could leave that mill and go home, and I mean, leave school and run that mill while my daddy was sick. There wasn't none of the boys in my class like hardly ever that worked that much. They was plowed and done what they had to. And uh, we had four acres of land that our plowed worked. But nevertheless, uh, that's, that is a cotton mill story, but it's a story of what I've been through, what I'm more proud of than anything else. But I went on up there and, and run that mill I was proud because I thought I was doing something that was real worthwhile and I was raised that way, but Daddy died in about eight days, so I didn't even go back to school no more. And I told them up that grandma, I said, I'm just as goddamn, excuse me, damn proud of that as I felt was the day I done. I am. But uh, that's the way that goes. But anyway. Uh, now, you work for his daddy. Yeah. Okay. His daddy and, and Harvey was one owned both mills up here, and Seymour was their boss man. Well, tell us about his daddy. I don't know nothing about him. He was a cat bird. <laughs> I said, Mr. White, I got a twenty-two rifle up yonder, and it. it, 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 it tell us about his daddy. Well, that's it. I said, I got a 22 rifle up home, and it goes far back out. When you shoot it, it's too far. Now, I'm going to cut that thing off and make it fit again back in, put it back in. And I was wondering if I could come to your shop up there and uh, get one of them fellas to let me have it. Nobody had drill bits. They let me have a drill bit to, to drill so far in that for another cottage to go in there. And I had to make a little place. I, my son still got it. Had to make a little place in there for the thing to roll the thing out. And he said, I know what you're telling me that you want to do. We said, I don't know where you can do it or not. I said, that sounds like a job. I said, it's handwork all but that, I think. He said, I tell you what to do. When you get ready, you come on up and you go on down there and you tell uh, Baines with the shop man down there. And said, you tell Baines in there what you got and said, he'll help you fix that. He said, he'll fix that for you. You can get it just like you want. I said, okay, and so I did, and you know what? I hadn't had got, hadn't hardly got any shop out there. Here come one man wheel in there. So you brought it? I said, yeah. And he took a look at it, too. He said, you may do it yet? I said, I'm going to do it. i got to do it. But anyway, uh, I thought he was about the nicest man i ever seen. He'd just take up something like that. But he, he was a whole lot more than Harvey was on something like that. Harvey, Harvey just didn't fool with that. And he set me up one time after he got sick, and he, he uh, well, he, he was still sick, but he was laying down taking a nap. And I went to the door and knocked, and his wife came to the door, and I told her, 
I come to see Mr. White if he's so that I could see him. I won't see him, just talk to him a little bit. She says, well, he's laying down right now. I said, I don't want to wake him up. She said, I, 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 he's laying down. I said, I just don't want to wake him up. I said, no, I don't want you to wake him up. I just want to know if he's doing all right. And I thought if he was, I'd talk to him a little bit about everything else. And uh, he said, I don't want a name. He called. I heard him when he called. He said, bring Bill on in here. <laughs> I went on in there and he was getting up on the couch. He was laying on on the couch. He had his coat, his necktie, and everything on. He had, he had just laid down there, he said. He down there the rest of the little bit. So what you doing down there? What's going on around here? And I, I was just went on we talked to him. He seemed, he, he seemed to be genuinely interested in me too and my wife and my two little young I thought they were good. He seemed, he seemed to be what, George? Could you say that again? Huh? He seemed to be genuine. That's the name I use. You don't know what it was. Uh, but anyway, I thought they was too good. I used to work the first work I done on when Bird Paler was a superintendent, and uh, he had two or three of his youngers was overseers down. That's where he used to work. You never did know pa pa Fowler, did you? No, I don't think no. you did. You ain't old enough. Bud Fowler. I've heard of him. We I, used I to, he used to be an old sale over Carolina Mill and the one ahead over here at uh, Graham. The one going out towards Burlington on the main street. Uh, not the main. Oneida. Yeah. Oh, so, Sydney, which? Sydney, uh, I guess it was on the main street. Yeah. Well, let me ask you once again. Uh, who do you think brought that strike here? It come from somewhere out of town. I don't think it, I just don't know. Uh, them mills up there, they were striking. That's what I've always had against the union. They run things just like the highway patrol. That I'm, I'm dead on the highway patrol in North Carolina. I'd just about as soon to shoot them as I would be some. And I don't know who gave them that much power but they shouldn't have. They took my license. I am only allowed to drive 10 miles from this house. Wherever I go, I can't go but 10 miles from this mm. house. And they stopped me. They stopped me to start with because I couldn't see. Well, I went and had my eye operated on, and, and when I come back down there to try for my license again, the girl said, uh, read line two. I read line two. I said, now you want me to take these glasses off and read the top line without them? No, no, you, that's all right, you're all right, ain't thing wrong with that. But that said, I'll have to give you a driving test. I said, I didn't fail the driving test, I said, I know, but I'll have to give you one. And then when he started to work on me with highway school, I'm still driving with that light. I got this restricted license to go uh, 40 mile an hour, and not on the super highway, and couldn't drive without my glasses, I couldn't drive at night. I don't know what all, but I've done along with that for about a year. And I went back to try to get my license. That's when I was back trying to get it. Was, oh, two girls gave me a driving test, and they turned me down and told the, the sergeant up here, this place up here, where I was referred to by the man in Raleigh to go up there. He was a safety sergeant. And uh, he told me who it was, but he wasn't there, and that two girls gave me the damn driver's test. And one of them said, you just scared me to death. I said, well, I wasn't supposed to take it anyway. Y'all just took this on me, I done took this test. But the second one, she, she, she was going to party about it. And she come back, she said, I'm going to give you another driving test. I said, you think you will? She said, yeah, I'm going to give you another test. So she took my record that she had given me, and the other girl had given me, give this sergeant was there sitting over here. I went over there and he done looked at it. He said, there, looked at it. Well, I said, Mr. Allen, said, I'm going to tell you this. I'll tell you something. He said, I'm going to give you a driver's test. And she's going to do no better than what you've done with them two girls. I said, I'm going to have to take your license. I said, well, let me ask you a question. You can answer me. You don't have to. I said, won't it do just a little, good, little bit of good if I go down to Raleigh and talk to the men down there 
that's over all this thing. No, sir. Said you can't do nothing down there. Said uh, you got to get all you gonna get is right here. And I never told him, but I had a thing in my pocket with a name and address on it, and the lawyer's name and the whole thing. Said give him two hundred and fifty dollars, he'd bring you your license, your full license. I didn't tell him I had that, and I ain't gone yet. But since they cut me to ten miles from home, that bad, but I wasn't allowed to drive on a super. My wife can drive, but she don't want to, unless she wants to go. Well, when we're still interested in this thing that happened back in the 30s. Yeah, did that's you, happening now. Though, did you see the uh, t the National Guard come here? I don't remember coming to Charlotte, but we didn't have no trouble down there. Just, we just left out because we were afraid they were going to come down here. That's what, that's what caused the fence around the mill. They put a fence around the mill, had the oak two or three gates, but they didn't ever open with the one up the front. And that fence went in, when did the, they build the fence? They built the fence right along about that time. They went to get the fence built. So, uh, I don't know where they had one up yonder or not either. But that, that, that strike, I don't know where it got. I just don't know. I don't know nothing about it. I never have been in a strike. I always raised, if you didn't like it, get out and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've done, and I did. <clears throat> I just got tired of this state one time. And I went to Atlanta. I had an aunt that lived down in, oh, about 15 or 17 miles from Atlanta. But I went to Atlanta and got a job, guess what? And the third biggest flour mill and cornmeal mill it was in the United States. The third one, Atlanta flour mill. It got so big that uh, they had to go to work in two shifts. And so I, I come home in. I didn't stay for long, but I used to pick a banjo. And uh, the uh, boy that I was in, uh, slept in the same room that I boarded in. He played a guitar. Me and him, we'd go up there and try them high wagons. When they come over down, they go up on the rooftop and practice. And we'd go up there every half the time. We couldn't play nothing with them, but they wanted they they to play with us and tried to. But uh, after, I wasn't married then. That was before. <laughs> Did you ever play baseball for the team, for uh -uh. The, the mill? Uh -uh. I told somebody the other day up yon I went to the ball game. My daughter worked at uh, Banker Shippers up here above Bullock. And, and they somehow, and other, I don't know how they do it, but they give them people up there a ball game ticket, whatever they ask for. And she always, she got two for us, two for her and her husband. And I told them, I, I know how to play roller bat, but bounce of that, I don't know much about. I never did play baseball. I reckon I couldn't catch him. Uh, what? I don't remember trying whatever having ball thing. You? No, I think they, they had one up at uh, main Trevor up in Graham. They had yeah. a park right out back of the mill. Yeah. I didn't remember trying. When I got that down here, well, well, Nell, I was living there when my wife died, and she died in 1942, I believe it was. And, but I tell you what, that whole bunch up there, Willie Phillips was a man up there, an old man Jim Bain, and they, they would just work with anybody, especially if they had sick. They, they worked for them like they would do anything they could for them. But, uh, well, they used to, when I was little, anybody got sick, at any cotton mill, and you about stuck together pretty good. But i tell you one thing I've, I've noticed here, this is not very nice. But we have been, and we lived at Glencoe and Carolina and Hopedale Mills and White Oak and Erlanger. And, uh, but what, what strikes me most is nearly every cotton mill we want to, the youngins all were full of lice. That, that's not nice at all, but that's the way it was. And my mother had a fine comb, and she had kept that fine comb right where she wanted, and a little uh, saucer there. And she, every day when we come from school, she'd set us down there most of the time, because we were in the house, especially in the weather at all. 
but she'd set us down and dip that fine comb in that comb. Well, she hardly ever would find a life, but she would. They'd get on your head when you're with other young. The young ones don't play, don't let the damn hell get it. The dear lady I hadn't heard of until oh, a few years back and got it down here at school. She was working down there in the kitchen then when they had it. And they said, had some of the niggas they took out of school, but they got straightened out, told them what it was, and they said the kind of people that about to show them how to take care of the young ones. But that was something that that they come out of and caught me up there. Well, the, the doctor's been telling us about his father coming around the mill to visit the, all the workmen and... Yeah. Looked like a tramp. Did he tell you that? No, he didn't tell her. He didn't? Well, why did you tell him? No, I just told him that he went around, made rounds in the mill. Oh, yeah. he come around and I'll tell you one thing you, I thought was nice in him. Neither one of them never did ask me what I was doing and mm -hmm. how... Uh, Oh, sometimes it's how you get along, but they didn't ask me what I'm doing here, and you work running that. That doing like an all are you are you doing that right or anything? They never said a word about how you work. Never did. And that was on their side, because I thought I was doing the best I could. Mm -hmm. But when Joe Phillips come around there, you know, they could have fired me for what I told him. He didn't fire me. He could if he would. He come on and told me I'd have to stop it. Every time I, I uh, thought work all I was running uh, speeders there and uh, fine speeders and uh, every time he'd off mall I want you to go around there and take all the little things off the top up here little up uh, hang up high and uh, and go up there and clean all these rollers up it would take at least a half hour I said he didn't like me for nickel because I, I worked from Gibsonville when he fired him from up there but that had been years ago and uh, I said, Big Joe, you know what I get paid for, don't you? Why? I said, by that damn Hank, that front roll. If it ain't rolling, I ain't getting no pay. And I ain't going to clean them rollers out but once a week. Now, you can put that down and smoke it. I ain't going to do it. And he didn't bother me about three times the whole time he's down here. But I, I know Big Joe wasn't going to stay with these folks down here. He he, he just learned his and but going to school somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, well, White Oak was the one first started. They sent him to school. I don't know how he got into it. but And I don't know how Willie got into it, but Willie was a different man, altogether different. Where did you live? This mill up here right at the end of the road on the right, the last house on the right. It's done been pulled down now. <laughs> what school did you go to when you were young? Huh? What, did you go to Harrow School when you were young? Uh-uh. I, I went to the last school I went to was Silver's. That's where I stopped in the seventh grade. But, boy, we had to get them grades at school wherever we went. We had to get them. I folks made them, but they didn't either one have no education. My daddy didn't have but but he didn't go to school for one day. That was back in the 1800s. But, uh... He had something that other men don't have. He had one thing that I'm proud of, and I learned a little bit, but I forgot it. He could take a framing square, framing square, and tell you on paper here everything you had to have to put in that house to build. He could take that square. They got letters all around there. He could tell you how long and how much angle to cut on and everything. He could do that, and he wrote everything he wrote in script. He never said he learned to read out of the Bible. And another thing, it was stupid, but uh, sounds stupid, but it ain't. He got interested in music. And he went to Indiana with some of his people. They got him to go to a singing, I mean, a music school. He learned to read and write music before he learned at ABC. <laughs> but he just sat down on the old organ and he just threw that thing. The first time he looked at it. He didn't have to practice. He looked at that thing and it played the hell out of it. He'd do that when he died. Was he a farmer? Most of the time he worked at grist mill. But if he'd done anything, he got a chance to do. He was down at Silver, I mean, the Cane Creek Church. They lived down there below that. They was in the same community when that uh, Cornwallis come down there and killed 60 some cows of them people around there. They feed his army with mm -hmm. and left the guts. And the, and the whole thing laying in the church. Didn't even take them out of the church. That's King Creek Church. 
Now, when did you, your folks move into to work in the cotton mill? Oh, I went up there when we lived down there. I, I went in there, there and worked, I don't know, two or three years until he got sick, I had to go home. So after that, well, I don't know what got happened wrong with him, I had to go home to run the mill. I had to leave my work to go down there. And then uh, he begged me so bad to quit. I stay back here said, we all get along together till I die anyhow. He, he was pitiful. Put his eye covered as hell. <laughs> did your children work in the mill? Huh. I never did have one. I had two over there. And they never did get big enough to old enough to work in the mill. And Bed Lee went to work at the telephone office and worked all over life. She went to work at uh, One of the stores up there. I got. I, I know the manager of one of them stores. It wasn't a. It wasn't a dollar store. It was, a, it was another store worked up on the corner there. But she went to work there, and she got a chance to go to the to the telephone company. She stayed there all her life then, mm -hmm. and she married a boy that had done the same thing. He went to the army and come back, and they done pretty good. Went down there this morning, got a bunch of tomatoes. Yeah. And I bet they had four bushes they could pull off of my vines now that was ripe. But Norman don't do nothing but he had two bad heart attacks. But he don't do nothing but his garden work. But anyway, uh, we ain't talking about the mill. There's some of it. I can't hear them. Those trucks are loud, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Those trucks are loud. Are loud. Trucks are loud. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was at the Carolina Mill one time, and a man come around there. <coughs> he he come from a uh, Howard and Bullard company, and he come to re reclose the cards in the mill. And of course, you you don't know what it is, but he had to have some help. That's why they told me to go help him, I had to help him uh, eight, five or six months, and that that's what we done, and we got it done. And then I done married and had the two youngers, I reckon, had the two youngers anyhow. And uh, down here, when Rabbit, uh, you don't know who Rabbit is, but that's Willie Phillips. <laughs> but our boss man, we call him Rabbit. But he come down, I said, Bill, said, we're going to have to take you off of these here a while. I said, what's happening? He said, call, said, we're going to do some changing here. And said, the man is uh, going to do the work. Said he couldn't, he couldn't work for nobody else but you. I said, well, who in the hell is he? He said, he just come by here. Didn't you see him? I said, no, I didn't see him. Said, he knows you. Then he see him. Said, he, he told me, said, I know that boy. And, uh, but when I worked with him before, I wasn't nothing but a boy. Well, first worked in the mill. Uh, but anyway, he come on down, and we went down to the low end there where there used to be lappers. And they changed that all into one machine. You put the cotton come in up here, it made a roll, and that roll went on back and got that down and got back to another machine about the same thing. You're getting, you're getting the stuff out of it, I reckon. Seeds, some seeds that were left in it and whatever. But I worked with him. I knowed him after he come in there and talked to me. And uh, it, that'd been, I reckon, at least 20 years, 25 years. Me and him got along good there that time, and he uh, got done with it. Then Rabbit come back down again after that, and uh, he come back there again, and uh, said, the Bill said, he's going to take you off of this again. I said, what's the matter? You going to do some more work? He said, yeah. I said, who's going to work? He said, I'll show him to you, Betty. I said, what was his name? I know that fellow's name good. But uh, he said, no, no, so it's Mahaffey. said, he'd be in a minute. I'm going to show him. He'd come in, a little old fellow, drawed up, neck that away. And he told me who it was. And he said, uh, he just pushed the things off, stopped the machine. He said, you can go down. And so I went on with Mahaffey. And uh, he got up there, and he gave me a bunch of keys. A uh, whole great big ring of keys there. And I looked at it. What's that for boxes? He said, there ain't a thing in them but tools and bits and things. He said, you're going to be looking at them. 
You know, whoever you let have one, or whoever you don't. Do you remember when Roosevelt uh, got elected? Yeah, but what, I don't remember much about it. Uh, what happened after that? You used to, you were working 12 hours a day or 11 hours a day. Yeah, and, and then, went on eight hours. And oh, we got a, a raise too for that. Yeah, we got a raise for that. But that's when we got Social Security. I think it was 1935, I believe. No, we, but, uh, oh, well, I think most of the people enjoyed the evenings. I went hunting every evening, bird hunting. I loved it. But uh, I think everybody liked that pretty good. And a whole lot of people didn't like Social Security. And I just didn't know what I liked or not. It was taking, oh, I believe it was 7 or 8% out of my time. You know, we didn't like that. When we got our time fled, it said total down to the bottom. We didn't say balance. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you get in there, it says balance. Yeah. They took out the damn wood. What did you pay for rent? Huh? What did you pay for rent? Four dollars a month. And I couldn't pay that one time. That's why my wife was sick. You know, I had to lose a whole lot of time. And the mill was running in. Though it's, it's like, it, uh, oh, we did some days we didn't get but two days a week. Mm -hmm. And I'm wearing John A. Tron, you own the house. And I wouldn't even have. Didn't think he was going to ask me to move. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do. But I, he come by that one day, I said, Mr. Tron, I was up there the other day, and you building a, you building a new barn. So mm -hmm. I'll be up there in the morning going to work. I saw myself, I saw him. Yeah, I'm building. Well, I'll tell you, if you're going to come on and work in the house, if you go up there, you see Mr. Poe, and he'll tell you what to do. He'll tell you what to do. And he went and told that old man that, that evening sometime, I'd be there the next morning. And said he could put a hand. Well, he wasn't So I did, and got the barn done. And I had to go back to work for, at the mill there then. And, uh, oh, yep. Yeah. But he come by. When he come by after the rent, he come by there and he said, I saw him, I said, it look like I owe you some money this morning. I said, well, I don't know. How much do you owe me? He he looked, said, I don't know. Let's have to count it up. And he counted it up. Oh, he said, you didn't know I owe me no much. No, uh, no, I said, you didn't pay it up. He said, you got to keep coming down my clip. I said, hell, that's about three months, ain't it? He said, yeah. I said, well, you marked me up three months. I told you I was going to work to pay my rent. I oh, saw sure. Yes, sir, Mr. Allen. And he, he was a pretty nice old man. They was married, but you can't Did, hold that against him. Was there a company store? No, he was a company house. He built it when he run the mill. Oh, for his dad and them bought it. He, I see. He run the mill. Him uh -huh. and Montgomery, I believe, uh -huh. over yonder. Well, Doctor, you were talking about them running the mills that had short time. That's right. That was during, That was in the thirties after yeah. the yeah, depression. Yeah, that was in the thirties. That was after his dad and the other man had bought it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, old man John A. Tronger built it and run it, and uh, him and that Montgomery lived across the river over down on the right over there somewhere. They used to own it. I believe you were talking about uh, they're running short time, but keeping it going so that people could get could pay their bills. Could you tell about that? Well, uh, <coughs> this was in the uh, 30s. Of course, the other mills, Oneida, I believe I'm right in that mill, Oneida closed and Sydney closed. The mills up in Graham, Sydney yeah. closed and Oneida closed. Yeah. And Trevor kept running, but they were only running two shifts a week. And uh, they uh, they did that primarily to keep the help. Twelve hours too. But just just two just two shifts a week yeah. on Monday, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, on Mondays and Fridays or whatever. But that was enough, make enough time to, to buy food and pay yeah. rent. Well, they've done that here two or three times. I, they didn't do that many times, up here, not while I was working. That was here. just during the depth of the Depression. Yeah. But uh, there used to be a hope, look a little bit like Seymour Armstrong Hope used to live in Graham. And he looked at the Talana Mill and that, uh, on that. I never did know who owned this other mill out here on the railroad next to the church. Uh, 